welcome. I am here once more to coat my fingers in chalk for your education. Um, yes, so uh, you probably wouldn't believe me if I told you this was a bird, so I won't attempt such, such a fabrication. We have a, a praying mantis, which definitely if these things were, were human-sized, they'd be completely terrifying. Um, another non-bird, uh, uh, a snake that's doing its best to appear as like a dangerous viper by kind of pulling in its neck, but it's all a ruse. This is a, a non-poisonous bull snake. Uh, one of the ways you can tell is that the pupils are round, like rattlesnakes and other vipers have like vertical pupils, but bull snakes do not, and they also have eyes that are kind of more on the side of their head than pointing forward. I trust myself to get close enough to the chat. <laughs> uh, yes, this, this, um, but psych, there are still birds. Uh, there's uh, an American pivot. Uh, after finishing a delicious bug, it gets very curious and it moves for a closer look and observes and then gets even closer and it's just a, a curious little bird. All right, couple uh, notes. The week two quiz uh, is available on Moodle. Uh, the fact that the term started on a Wednesday continues to be havoc. So this quiz and probably many of the quizzes will include some material from the day that they're released. So part of the quiz includes material from today. Um, other things, since Lab Zero is uh, due tonight, you can of course use uh, late days uh, if you need to. I wanted to show that if you're on, say, Mantis, and you're wondering, well, how do I get the Q, the handin.tar file uh, from uh, Mantis uh, in order to uh, uh, in, in order to turn it in on Moodle, um, if you have documents, ES208, if you have a folder open like this, this isn't the lab files, but you can look at the files over here on the left, you can right click on a file and you can download it. Uh, directly to your computer so then you can then upload it to Moodle. So if you are, have been working on Mantis, um, that is how, that is a convenient way to get the files off of Mantis onto your own computer. Question, Sam? Is this possible to do through like a terminal as a thing? So, yes, so there is a terminal command. Um, uh, it's called SCP, which is like copying over S, uh, SSH. And so to do this, uh, you would put in uh, your, the kind of, um, uh, uh, web address uh, there, and then a colon, and then the path on Mantis to the file that you want to copy. So I might say uh, documents slash um, CS208 slash fall21 slash structs.c. And then I would just, after that, put a dot for copy it to the current directory. And it will like show a little progress for downloading. It was very, very small file. And if I ls, I see that structs.c has been, has been copied from it. So you can do this over the command line if, if you would prefer. Other questions about the lab or image representation, anything else? Lisa? I just love to know how to do a lab to do the thing with the end right now, or do you like to just make the content for the lab, uh, lab one? Uh, yes, yeah, so lab one uh, will use things from uh, that we've been looking at through, with integer representation, and then uh, very importantly, the Operators that uh, we'll talk about today that operates on bits was sort of the other piece. Other questions? Okay, so 
Let's talk about uh, bitwise operators. And this term bitwise comes from the fact that these operators apply on the level of individual bits. They are kind of directly operating uh, on the bits, is how we'll think of them. And the reason that we care about these is that because they are operating on the individual bits, uh, and because our bits, and because we're using bits that are zero and one, since they kind of have this correspondence with high voltage, low voltage uh, in the actual hardware, these bitwise operations, we can implement kind of a specific circuit that can do a specific bitwise operation, and this makes it both very fast and very power efficient. And it doesn't take that much electricity uh, or energy for the system to do so. Uh, when we're thinking about low level uh, operations, we're often thinking uh, in turn, kind of on the order of the specific bits in memory, uh, but also, we like to use operations that are as efficient as possible. Uh, and when the compiler turns our C code into instructions for the CPU, it also takes into account that if we can do things with these efficient bitwise operators, we will. And so as we uh, start looking into assembly, uh, we'll, we'll encounter that. Um, and so, these bitwise operators will Interpretation of the bits as an integer or, or a memory address, whatever, they're just going to take whatever bits are, are in memory and, and operate directly on those. So, for these, uh, for some examples, I'm going to use two specific uh, four bit uh, quantities. So first we have bitwise and, which is written in C as a single ampersand. So uh, we would say A ampersand B would be the expression of performing bitwise AND between these two. And so if I kind of write this out in a kind of a, a vertical format, as you might expect from an AND, if both bits are 1, we get a 1, otherwise we get a 0. So 1, 1, is 1, 0 and 0 is 0, 0 and 1 is 0, 1 is 0, 0. But how did you get those numbers? So for every pair of bits, and that's what our, our bitwise operators are going to do, they're operating directly on the bits, and then ones that are binary that take two, uh, uh, two operands, every pair of bits will then result in some output bit. And because this is an AND, the output is 1 only when both inputs are 1. Okay. Is it possible to do that with bit sequences Can we do this with bit sequences with different lengths? Uh, at one level, yes. Uh, at another level, 
No, because when we do it with, with ones of different lengths, one of them will be uh, uh, converted to be the same length as the other. Um, and I think the, the, the C compiler might even uh, might not even let you do this with, with two different types, or at least we'll warn you. Uh, other questions? All right. So uh, we have an and. You might imagine that we also have a bitwise or. which we wrote with a single vertical pipe character. So on this keyboard over here, it's the key above return. So it normally has a, a forward slash, but shift and you shift it, and that key gives you this, this vertical pipe character. And we write A, or B, and we can do the same A or B here. And so for A and B, we had A was one when both inputs were one, or is going to give us one when I am is one. So two ones, that'll be one, two zeros is a zero. And then since either of these you know, one and any of those, we get one, one, zero. That makes sense? Question though? What's the point of this? Like, why would you want to do this? So why do we want to do these uh, bitwise operators? Um, the first part is, is what I said before, that because these are operate, doing these simple operations on uh, the, the individual bits, it's easy to create a dedicated circuit that does this operation in the hardware. Which means that when we want to do a bitwise add or a bitwise or, it's very fast and doesn't take much electricity because we can just implement it directly in the hardware as opposed to do it through some sequence of general purpose instructions. So that's why we want to use these. And then it turns out there are lots of uh, situations where we can uh, uh, do something using these uh, using these operators. And, uh, one uh, common thing, if we are if we're in a system that has very a very small amount of memory, and Storage is some fixed size. So say like we have to store things in like 64-bit chunks. Then we might want to basically kind of make uh, as efficient use of our storage as possible. And 
when we want to kind of move bits around and combine them in different ways, we need to use these bitwise operators. And so uh, these come up both in understanding what compilers do, because they'll use these because they're more efficient, in dealing with a very constrained memory, we need to kind of pack things together. And I'll show an example later of how we can use these operators to do something like this combined. Other questions? Yeah. What does it even like? What does it mean for storage to be a fixed size? Like, can you only operate on like one one out of every eight bits, or like only store one out of every eight bits? Like, how, how does how does that uh, restriction implemented? So, so far we've thought of memory as a huge array of individually addressable bytes. That's not the only kind of memory that exists in computer systems. And when we start talking about assembly, we'll see a new kind of memory, which is we have a specific 64-bit thing called a register that has a name rather than an address. And this is, for example, the memory that's physically part of the CPU, or this sort of register stuff. And so that's when you might end up with like, okay, I have register X, and if it's 64 bytes, and I can just like put 64, 64 bits in there. It's not a, it's not separated out into, into addressable bytes. Other questions? All right, let us resume our tour of uh, these bitwise operations. Uh, we have and, we have or, and then we have XOR for exclusive OR, a very uh, uh, important and, and rarefied OR. And for this, we will use the caret symbol, the, the symbol that goes with uh, six on a keyboard. Um, and so something worth keeping in mind that there is no exponent operator in C. There are like built-in math functions to do exponents, but if you if you use this thinking you're doing an exponent, it's going to do this bitwise operation, um, and not at all what you want. So again, write a x or b. And what this does is it's one when either input is one, but not when both inputs are one. That's that's the exclusive part. So it's like or but when both inputs are one, we get a zero. So both inputs being one or zero, both inputs are zero, we get a zero. But when just one of the two is one, we get a one. Questions on this? All right, and finally, We have not, which is uh, a unary operator that applies to just one, one quantity. And we use for this the tilde. So we'd say tilde A for not A, and it simply flips the bits. It changes zeros to ones and ones to zeros. So not a, we change ones to zeros and zeros to ones. What are your questions so far? Yes? Um, so for 
for the app store and a board, is there any situation that you can like have more than two um, voltages, like three together, or you can only apply it when there's like only two? Uh, these are all binary operators, meaning that they take two and puts just like addition or multiplication or division, they just have a left and a right. So you just like have kind of, you would apply it to two and then the result of that with a third is how you, how you would get through together. Lisa? And then the binary text of Sorry? And then the binary text of Yes, uh, I am showing these all in binary, because that way we can see what the bits are doing. Uh, but in C, you can apply these between any images. And it's just whether you can write them down as hexadecimal or decimal or binary. Uh, so yes, you, you could use them. But when you use them, like, like it converts them into binary and performs the operation, if you can only hexadecimal. So I wouldn't say convert, because everything is stored in binary. In the hardware. So it reads it. Yeah, like the operation is defined in terms of the ones and zeros. In terms right. of I guess my question is like, there's no like different application for hexadecimals where, you know, because there's, there's only, you know, this doesn't work on something where there's more than two values for the, the digits. So. Um, yeah, so, so every, all the data we were storing on a computer is in ones and zeros, and anything that has more than ones and zeros is just like a different way that we are viewing or interpreting or displaying. Um, but yes, these bitwise operations are defined for quantities that are in, in bits and ones and zeros. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. How does this differ from the way that C might read uh, these expressions in the if statement? Um, you mean like if you had if A or B? Yeah, but let's say the you had variables for other things, like is it doing something different or is it just looking at the binary implications for that? Um, yeah, so uh, we'll get to this in a moment, but in C, there is no true and false. Zero is false, everything else is true. Uh, so it would do this and just look, is it zero or false? Other questions? So there's one interesting uh, uh, wrinkle to this knot where we've been thinking about twos complement integers and uh, how to do arithmetic with them. And one thing that comes up in arithmetic is the idea of an additive inverse, meaning that if I have x and I add x to the additive inverse of x, I will get 0. Additive inverse just means the quantity that when we add it to the original gives us 0. What's the way that we usually write the additive, additive inverse of an inverse? Negative x. Yeah, so this, like, just added in with an x, negative x. But when we're talking about these bitwise operations, this minus operator, sort of unary minus, uh, doesn't tell us what happens to the bits of x to give us, like, negative x in two small. Like, we have in these four bits, if it was two's complement, it would be five, uh, since we have a four and a one. And we might wonder, well, how do we know what bits will give us negative five? Like, we could puzzle it out, but maybe there's some sort of easier way involving kind of some operation on the bits to give us that. And so, one thing that we can say is, well, maybe if we just flip the bits, that's going to be helpful in getting to the negative number. And so if we say, uh, 
x plus not x. I'd like you to discuss with your neighbors for a minute or two of what x plus not x. It's going to give us the same thing for any x. So talk with your neighbors about what that's going to be. Right. 
Are you going to get it to get 0, 1, 1, 1, then you add 1, and then it's yeah. 1, 1, 1. Uh, yes. Uh, we flip it, we add it, and then we add 1. We'll add 1. Right, 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 yes. So, we do our, our we Flip it, add one to that. And get uh, uh, one zero zero zero. And so yeah, this is what I was I was trying to show. That if we take if we negate the largest negative number, we just get back the same the same thing. So this is this edge case under two's complement that because we have one more negative value and we have positive values, the, add, the additive inverse of our maximum negative value is itself. Because what I, what I showed the first time was we add these two together and we get zero. Yeah? I guess you might have just said it, but like, since we're in a four bit system, if you add it to itself, wouldn't it just like, like the one will go over past, but then we ignore that, so it's just all zeros anyway. That's right. So, so that satisfies this additive inverse. That if we take the maximum negative number and add it to itself, we get zero. So it's its own additive inverse. So uh, this is an edge case that you will need to keep in mind for a while. That negating the maximum negative number uh, will, will just give you back another negative number, the same thing. Does that make sense? Questions on this? Yeah, but adding the two largest negative numbers would get you here. That's right. Okay, so there are some more bitwise operations that uh, we will explore. The first will be we're going to look at the bit shifting operations. And for this, we have left shift, and right shift. And as we'll see, there are two kinds of right shift. So shifting refers to taking our bits and just moving them left or moving them right some number of places. And so we write these uh, using kind of two less thans or two greater than it's. So they're kind of pointing in the direction that we are shifting the bits. And our left shift would be, I put A back up here. If I say A, left shift two, that means slide A over two places. So that's going to mean that I take my four bits here and slide them over two places. So These two are now in the same place that the upper two were before, so I've just slid this over two places, and I have kind of two empty spots. 
that I've created. And we just fill those in with zeros, and we forget about any that shifted off past the end. Because we, we're dealing with fixed width quantities. So we have four bits here. We shifted two off the end, and we fill in two zeros. So let me rewrite this in a less messy way. So the one shifts over two places. Zero shifts over two places. This zero shifts over two places. This one shifts over two places. We fill in, we fill in two zeros in the empty spots, and we throw away the bits that shifted off the end. And so our result of A shifted by two, zero, one, zero, zero. Yes. So, like, for any n value of like shifting, like a shifted over by n, like the last n digits of the, the new binary number are going to be zero. That's right. Yeah, we'll fill in n zeros uh, from uh, from the right. So, one observation we can make about left shift is analogizing it to uh, uh, decimal numbers, which we're more used to thinking about. So if I have the decimal number one, and I shift it over two places, what number, and I fill in with zeros, what does that give me? Uh, no, if we're doing this in base 10. 100, yes. So if we take one and we shift it over two places, we end up with 100. And so each time we shift over, we multiply by 10. We moved uh, the, our number over by one and filled in a zero. So left shifting is going to have an analogous effect in binary where each time we shift over, we'll multiply by some factor. What's that going to be? Two. Two. Because each place we shift over in binary multiplies our number by two. Now, the one caveat to this is that because we shift thing, we throw away any bits that we shift off the end, we may, we may not end up with if we started with a large number, or if we have a very small number of bits, we may not actually get like eight times our original number. If it's not possible to represent that uh, in our in our bits, but if in our four-bit world, if we have one left shifted by two, what will that give us? Zero one zero zero which is four. So we did one, shifted two, that's times two each shift, so we'd expect one times four. And so we Shifting is much more efficient on the kind of, uh, on the level of, of individual CPU operations than multiplication. And so any time the system can accomplish arithmetic using shifts instead of, say, multiplication, it will do so because that that will um, that will improve performance. Yes. Do you just specify that or compiler? Or just uh, this, these are the decisions the compiler is making when it translates your C code or any other code into instructions for the system. Yes. So if you have like a one zero 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 for like this, and then you shift to to the last two bits, would that be like from eight to zero? Yes, the, the once given any like four bit number, if you shift it to the left four, you're guaranteed to get zero, because you're just going to shift everything off. Other questions? All right, let's talk about right shift. Same principle applies. And say A right shift two, 
and we have our A, and now same shifting over two places. And we have kind of two places on the left now that have, that have opened up, and we're going to throw away the two that we shifted off the end. And I mentioned two kinds of right shift, and those two kinds determine what we fill in in these empty spots. And that says fill in with zeros. And this is what we will use this is what we will use when shifting unsigned numbers. of the most significant bit, so our kind of our sine bit um, in two's complement, our negative weight bit. And so as you might imagine, this kind of shift is used when it's applied to sine one. So our shift of A here Our logical would give us zero, zero, one, zero, because we filled in these two places with zeros. And under arithmetic, we fill in with copies of our most significant bit. And so we end up with one, 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 zero. Just got two pieces of chocolate. And this filling in with zeros or filling in with copies of uh, the most significant bit, uh, make it so that this, uh, this right shift divides by two for unsigned and signed quantities, just like our left shift multiplied by two. So under our, uh, if this was unsigned, you'd say eight and one, is nine, and shifting right two spots should divide by two twice. So we should get nine divided by four. This gives us two, which in integer terms is what we'd expect, nine divided by four. If we interpret this as a, a sign number, we have, what, what do we get if this is two complement? Yeah, negative eight plus one gives us negative seven. And again, we expect it to be divided by four. And what is this in two's complement? Yeah, it is negative two, because we have negative eight, a four, and a two. And does that give us negative two? So this Filling in with the, the sine bit keeps is going to give us a, a result of the of the same sign. It's going to uh, give us this this property that right shifting divides by two just like left shifting multiplies by two. What are your questions about this? <laughs> um, yeah. Could you explain why they divide by two? So. Every time we shift, well, if it's left, we're multiplying by two. If it's right, we're dividing by two. 
So this these divided by four is we're shifting twice, so it's like divide by two and then divide by two again once for each shift. And so I simplified that to divide by four. Okay. Can you explain the divide by the shift? Yes. So this this example where we had. Um, if, mul if this multiplying by two would give us uh, a result that's kind of too large for the number of bits we have to represent, then it's not going to actually multiply by two because we're getting rid of the extra digits. But in the case where we say had one and we last shifted twice, we expect that to multiply by two twice for a total of four. And it takes us from here here in bits, and that will go take us from one to, to four. So it's like we had, uh, like if we if we just think in decimal, and we had five, and we shift that over one spot, we get fifty. We kind of multiply it by ten, and we shift it over once. And if we shift it over again, we get 500, so we multiply by 10 twice. So it's the same principle as applying to less shifting in, in binary. Just with this wrinkle that we, if we might shift this off the end and then end up with a smaller number than we started with. Other questions? All right, last new thing, and then uh, we'll do some practice. And this, this new thing I hope will be uh, already familiar to you uh, because uh, Java just stole it from C. Um, Java was inspired by the majesty that is C. Um, and these are, Boolean operators. So uh, if we have Java and we want to say two Boolean things and so true if both of them are true, uh, how do we how do we write that? Yeah, we write it with double ampersand. And if we have or, what do we write? Double pipe. And uh, for not, an exclamation point. And so this and and or, uh, there's, uh, fortunately, the, comp the compiler is pretty good about warning about this. Uh, but uh, it's easy to say use one ampersand when you mean two, or use two when you mean one, uh, and do a bitwise operation or a Boolean operation uh, when you mean to do the other. So uh, the other thing I mentioned earlier is uh, C does not have special true and false, like capital T true and capital F false. Uh, it just uses. If we have an if statement or a loop condition, anything like that, zero is false. And not zero, every other value is treated as true. Yeah? I've noticed so far that when we go into like, like lowercase true, like highlights it, it says true, what value, like is it just one? Yes. So if you, if you write true in your code, uh, it's just one. And so this means that if we have, say, not hex 41, this is going to evaluate to zero, to false. This hex 41, it's not zero, it's true, not true, gives us false. 
Yes. Does that mean that not not is zero x forty one is just one? Exactly. And if we have not not x one two three four one two four four, that's just one. Because not any number that's not zero gives us zero, and not zero gives us one. This again, handy trick for the lab. Not not turns any non-zero number into one. And just not turns any uh, non-zero number into zero. If we have hex 55 and hex zero, double ampersand, this is just going to give us zero. As we have zero false and true, and and is only true when, when both things are true. Similarly, x55 or x0 would just give us one, just give us true. What are your questions on this? All right, let's do some practice. Wake up. Nope, cannot read my fingerprint when it's covered in chalk. So. In the notes for today, there are a number of practice problems. So let's make this bigger. So we can apply all the operators that we talked about to any integer in C. Uh, and so I have here a number of problems that are all operating on chars, which are one byte integers. And so the result, so that, that's why everything is written in two hex digits, because that's one byte. And the result of all of these will be a single byte, two hex digits. So I would like you to, uh, yes, uh, What are the byte shifting, which uh, style are you assuming? Uh, th these will all, these, char is a signed type. So we'll use the arithmetic right shift. Um, so I'd like you to uh, work with your, your neighbors to go through all of these uh, and figure out what the resulting byte will be. All right, I want to make sure you have a chance to ask questions about these. Uh, so uh, first thing that I uh, want to ask is, uh, when you were, say, turning some of these hex values into binary, uh, how did you approach that? Christian? Like for the first one, hex 41, I first write out one in four binary digits, which is from left to right, zero, 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 one. Then I write the next nibble, um, four, which is gonna be zero, one, zero, zero, yeah. Yeah, so we can take each hex digit and turn it into the corresponding four bits. We don't have to try and reason out, okay, hex 41 is 4 times 16 plus 1, which binary things are going to be 1 to add up to that value. We can just go straight from digit to bits um, without that sort of harder intermediate step. So that's, that's one, one takeaway. Uh, so if we, if we apply not to 41, uh, what's that going to do? Yep, flip the bits. All of these uh, zeros are going to become one. And then we can use the same trick to go from groups of four bits back to uh, the corresponding hex. So what is, what is
what is that going to give us in hex? Okay, we'll give D and E for, for our hex. Uh, how about not zero? Yeah, all the zeros become ones, four ones is our hex digit S. All right, now into our bitwise uh, operators. Uh, if I were doing this on a paper, I'd probably take these two and kind of do the vertical, like look at each pair of bits. Um, and for n, what is the, the rule that this applies? Yeah, we need both to be one uh, in order for the, the output, output to be one. And so what is the what is the hex value we get? Six. Some, Six. some mumbles. Four zero. Four zero is uh, everything's going to be zero except for this single bit is the only place that they both have a one. Uh, or we're going to get a one when either of them are one. So what's this going to give us? Yeah, this will be x seven d. Uh, we're going to end up with ones in, in most of the places uh, for this. Questions on on either of these? All right, how about shifting 34, 1 to the left? Well, we, we, multiply, we know shifting 1 to the left multiplies by 2. Guesses on what x34 turns into when we multiply by 2? Yes. And if we worked out the, the the bits here, we see that we'd end up 0, 1, 0, 0, shift that to the left, fill in with a 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, shift that to the left, and indeed that's 6 and 8. So it does work, left shift multiplies by 2. I have not been lying to you this whole time. All right, 68 right shift by 2. 17. Yeah, I think this will be 1a, uh, and uh, we can do the same, uh, uh, the same thing. We're going to shift these two off, and we'll get 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and then we fill in with the most significant bit, two zeros, and we see 1 and a. Questions on either of those? And then we have some uh, uh, Boolean stuff, not zero. Yep, that's going to give us one. How about not not x41? Yep, also going to give us one. And then we have some exciting nonsense here. What is uh, not x20? Zero. Yeah, so we have zero or zero, which gives us zero, not zero, which we saw earlier. Yeah. Oh, um, yes, I have a leaving off, leaving off the leading zeros. Um, but yes, if we were writing out the full, uh, the full eight bits, we would write zero. Yeah, by convention, leaving out digits implies that they're just all digits. Yes. Um, for shifting x six eight right two times, how uh, common like the divided by two or like how do you get the So. We divided by 2 twice. So we divided by 2 once would give us 34. 
And then uh, 34 is um, 3 sixteenths and a 4 is 52. And in decimal, we divide that by 2, we get 26. And 26 is a 16 uh, plus a 10. So, uh, like to, because we 3 doesn't divide by 2 to like a, a particular digit, it's like uh, it's 1 and a half. So, that it works out to, to 1a. So, the, the division by 2 did work, it just wasn't uh, as intuitive when we're dividing 34 by 2. Does that make sense? Because um, like if I were to divide 34 I get 17, does this only apply here where like you got the 3 to that 7 you get the 8? Uh, so this is hex 34. Yeah. So in decimal would be 52. Um, uh, but yes, when we divide uh, 30 in hex by 2, we don't get 7. Uh, we don't get um, uh, 15 like we would in. Um, uh, in decimal. All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, next time we will finish up with uh, the example uh, that I didn't get to about how to combine quantities into a single uh, chunk of memory using this bit shifting, talk a little bit about floats, and then we'll start in on assembly. So read the lab one handout, bring your questions on Wednesday, and I will see you then. Thank you.